I am a known Mac Pro 2013 hater. Which is funny since I wrote the definitive Mac Pro upgrade guide for these very computers, so I set out to change this by editing my entire Mac Pro 2013 video on a Mac Pro 2013. This is the first time I've ever had hands-on with a Mac Pro 2013 despite being somewhat of an expert on them. So, my first impression of the Mac Pro 2013 is... It's striking, and maybe even a bit stunning. That is, until you plug all the cables into it. I figure I'll do some periodic check-ins with my impressions while editing with this computer. So far, I had a few hitches, mostly with the 4K displays and my storage, and I'll talk about that more later in the video. But my project is really simple, and things seem to be going really great. <laughs> I honestly didn't realize how elegant they look in person. I'm surprised as it's aesthetically pleasing and looks more like an art piece than a computer. It's one of the biggest industrial design statements I've ever seen, but I hate what it has to say as this entirely form over function, designed for design's sake, and completely out of touch with what the market needed. Let me break down why I have such a bias against this computer. If we were able to distill the ideal Mac Pro down into three ideas, they would be upgradability, modularity, and expansion. This computer might surprise you as it's two of these things. It's a modular design and it is upgradable. Even the GPUs are swappable or upgradable, although good luck finding them as they're non-standard. There are only three GPU models for this computer and Apple refused to sell them as upgrades. The one thing this computer is not is expandable. It is devoid of any PCIe slots and only has one lonesome SSD card slot. I don't want this video to turn into a rant, but this is from the era of 2011 to 2013 when Apple decided to tell its professional user base to go enjoy themselves. I can't say something that loaded without explaining myself, so here's a brief timeline. In 2011, Final Cut Pro X was released, but missing many key features. Aperture fell behind Lightroom, and in 2012, the MacBook Pro Retina nixed upgradable RAM, and it also introduced NGFF SSDs rather than use the M2 standard as another special fuck you to consumers. And finally, the Mac Pro 2013 was released, a computer that most professionals did not want, but many had no choice but to buy. All right, now I'm starting to see the limitations here. That scene you just watched with all the animated stuff on screen, that wasn't that complicated, but it started dropping a lot of frames. All right, that's the end of the rant. Apple has tepidly repaired some of its professional standing by continuously updating Final Cut Pro X from a very good to if not great video editor, along with releasing some of its computers aimed at pros, only to walk it back again. Now for the second reason why I'm biased against this computer. The Mac Pro 2013 gets the dubious honor of being a Mac that was worse than the computer was meant to replace. I'd like to say that this is the only instance, but there are others. Objectively, the Mac Pro 5,1 was a much better computer, especially in the long run. I could spend quite a bit of time on this video explaining blow by blow why the Mac Pro 5,1 is better than the 6,1 or the 2010 through 2012 is better than the 2013, but when one computer has standard PCIe slots and the other does not, the one with PCI is going to have a huge advantage especially in the GPU department. Therein lies the problem with this computer. It's the G4 Cube all over again. Beautiful, impressive industrial design and thermally limited. I can see how the defenders of this computer were taken by its design, but my nerd brain just can't let go of not abandoning PCIe. The Mac Pro should be boring. The Mac Pro 2013 was anything but. This particular model I bought came preloaded with a 12 core 2.7 gigahertz CPU. This is the best overall CPU for this computer and it's maxed out with 64 gigabytes of RAM. I wanted to do a CPU and RAM upgrade myself for the sake of the video but it was actually cheaper just to buy one maxed out. Technically you can put 128 gigabytes of RAM in this computer but it'll run at a much lower speed as it's not recommended. The eBay listing didn't specify which GPU this computer had, so I'm going to just assume it's the lowest end D300 GPU, because I'm just not that kind of lucky. We will talk about GPUs more in a minute as it's the Achilles heel of this computer. This computer didn't come with an SSD, so I bought one, and let's just crack it open. For the first time opening one, it was completely hassle-free. It really feels like Apple is trying to invite you to open it up to marvel at its design, and it's damn impressive. This computer sports not one, but two GPUs. I think most of my viewers already know this, but it's weird seeing it in person. Installing an M2 NVMe SSD requires an M2 to NGFF adapter. 
I really had to wedge this in to get it to bolt down. Close it up, and it's time to finally boot the computer. Except it didn't work. It'd chime, which is a good sign, but then it'd start to rev up its fans and go into leaf blower mode. The GPUs in these computers are really prone to dying, especially in the higher end configurations. Apple gambled on dual GPU configurations would become normalized and preferred to single more powerful GPUs, despite little evidence of this being the trend beyond rare PC enthusiasts doing this for gaming. Even back in 2013, this would have been a new paradigm. Only one of the GPUs is used to render video, while the other provides just additional compute. Two GPUs equals double the potential TDP, which translates to double the potential heat. Apple would famously admit much later that they had designed themselves into a thermal corner. From the outset, they were at the limit of this design's ability to dissipate heat with its single fan. It was an ill-suited design for a performance PC, and it shows as scores and scores of Mac Pro 2013s with the upper-end GPUs, like the D500 and especially the D700, cooked themselves to death. Editor's note, I have no idea which GPUs I'm presenting on screen. All right, it's been a while since I've seen performance like this. That bad TV effect couldn't render in real time. Apple ended up issuing an extended warranty for the D500 and D700 GPUs, because they kind of cooked themselves to death. Even then, with all the problems, it's still a bit of an engineering marvel that they were able to cram two GPUs and a workstation CPU into such a tiny footprint. The Mac Pro 2013 is just a lot smaller than most computers. On screen is a comparison to Mini ITX, and I know this doesn't mean a lot to my Mac user audience, but this is the smallest platform for full-size, dedicated GPU computers. Again, the Mac Pro 2013 has two dedicated GPUs. My fear was the Mac Pro 2013 was dead on arrival, so I cracked it open once more as I had read online that the fans revving could mean a loose GPU connection, especially if the previous owner had swapped one or more of the GPUs. This gave me the excuse to partially disassemble the computer to check the cables. While it is annoying to take the bottom and top off, it is pretty easy. I didn't need a guide to even do it. The only tricky part is taking off the top fan, which requires a belt cable to be unscrewed and then popped off, along with the Wi-Fi antenna. With the bottom off, I could clearly see the GPUs were plugged in. At this point, I still had no idea which GPUs I had in front of me. Again, this is the first time handling one of these computers. I'm sure there's some visual cues, but I just don't know them. There was also the chance that the Mac Pro 2013 didn't like my SSD. I tried to reseat the SSD without a screw. Once I put it back together, I tried booting again and it outputted a picture this time, but it couldn't find the SSD. And then I remembered the Mac Pro 2013 is picky about SSDs. Fortunately, I had an old 128 gigabyte Apple SSD from a MacBook Air 2015. Sure enough, the computer booted off the SSD as it already had Mac OS on it. I was finally able to answer the mystery of what GPUs this little guy had, and of course it was the D300s, the lowest end GPUs with 2GB of VRAM on each GPU. The next step was to upgrade the OS to the last supported OS by Apple for this computer, Monterey. I could install OpenCore, but I wanted to experience this machine at its best, and there's complications around GPU support with it in macOS 13 and above. Next, I installed a suite of software like Final Cut Pro X, Motion, Pixelmator, Logic Pro, and Sound Studio to prep this computer for editing this video. The biggest blocker for me would be the lack of fast storage as I'd be limited to an AHCI SSD and a tiny one at that at 128 gigabytes. Usually my video projects are about 30 to 60 gigabytes when all the footage is ingested and transcoded, but some cross 100 gigabytes. With the transcodes, this project's well over that. It's about 250 gigabytes. I desperately needed more storage. The Mac Pro 2013 has Thunderbolt 2 and USB 3.0. I have two Samsung T7s, except for when I connected them, I only got USB 2.0 speeds until I found the right cables and was able to get over 330 megabytes a second. This should be fast enough for 4K 30 as long as I don't do too much compositing, and yes, I realize I could buy an Apple Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 USB-C adapter for better speeds. So now for the impressions, I used two 4K displays and the Mac Pro 2013 would only output 4K at 30 Hertz, which is kind of painful. 
The next issue I experienced was a small one, but still weird. When I went to record my voiceover in Sound Studio, for whatever reason it didn't display all my audio outputs, so I had to connect my headphones to my audio interface while recording so I could hear my own audio. This is the exact same setup I've used with three other computers without problems, my classic Mac Pro, Mac Pro 2019, and M1 Max. I think it's finally time for me to record my impressions of this computer, and it's best if I don't use a script. So bear with me. Well, I had to make some concessions while editing this video. Right now I'm using my iPhone 14 Pro connected to my M1 Max because I totally forgot it takes Ventura or above to use an iPhone as a webcam. I could have updated to OpenCore on my Mac Pro 2013 to see if I could get it to work, but I may have introduced more problems and more headaches because Open Core, um, well, it's actually not Open Core's fault, but macOS Ventura just doesn't work as well with the older metal drivers, which are required for the Mac Pro 2013. So it's kind of a dead end with this computer because you can't get truly native metal support. And also it doesn't have AVX2, which is a CPU instruction set that doesn't allow for certain applications to run. They'll just crash because it expects to have a certain CPU instruction the computer can't operate. And then that's the end of it. So it's kind of the end of the line for this computer, but I still wanted to use it and experience it in the best way possible. So far it's been kind of impressive and not so at the same time. It constantly is dropping frames. And I think that's partly because I'm running in 30 Hertz and then partly just because this computer's GPUs are bad. This isn't a Mac Pro 2013 problem, but man, my lighting looks terrible in the scene. I didn't see that on the camera. I bet if I had the D500s or especially the D700s, my experiences would be a lot better. But unfortunately, those cost a lot more money and I don't make very much money on YouTube, not enough to justify the money I spend on this computer, which is $200. Would I say this computer's worth it? Absolutely not. Unless you have a very specific use case, and I can imagine a couple, mostly VMs or legacy software, this computer might be a great buy. It's small, compact, and you can just tuck it away for when you need to use it for the legacy stuff. And it's also fairly quiet. It's not as quiet as I expected. I would constantly hear just the slightest hum of the fan while working. It's not as silent as working on an M1 Max or even a Mac Pro 2019. Is my voice off? Because I keep trying to correct these clips and you know what? I can't tell. I think it's because it's just dropping frames. Another very unexpected observation that I had was just how loose the ports are on this machine. I don't know if this is a common problem or if this is just this computer being wear and tear or a manufacturing defect, but if you go to plug in a USB or Thunderbolt device, you could potentially bump any of the other cables and disconnect them. This is bad, especially if you're using external media like I am with my SSDs, editing off them directly, because if mid-write you happen to bump the drive and unplug it, it could potentially corrupt the drive or cause a lot of problems with the program and crash it, whatever. But with journal mode in Mac OS, most of these problems are mitigated against. And fortunately, I never had a bad issue with this. Everything just reconnected and it was fine, but that's still something else that was not great, especially in a computer that forces all the devices to be external. So did I have my opinion radically altered on this machine by using it for a week to edit this video? Well, not really. And that's kind of to be expected because I'm using a 2024 workflow on a 2013 machine. I feel like my opinions would have changed radically if I just kind of forgot that I was using this computer and was just editing, but too many things were constant reminders. The slow disk speeds, which would have been helped if I used a better SSD, or the choppy animations, and not just because I was using 4K 30 Hertz, which also con constantly just reminded me I was not on a modern computer. Having everything choppy when you're just dragging your mouse around is one thing, but another thing is watching animations hitch or playback just kind of stutter constantly. And I even dropped down the preview quality in Final Cut Pro. So it definitely feels like 11 year old computer. The other problem is, is this computer, like I previously mentioned, I paid $200 for, and for $300 now you can get M1 uh, Mac Minis, and those 
are going to just absolutely mop the floor with it. Even with eight gigabytes of RAM and only 256 gigs of storage, for most tasks, that's just going to be much better. Where I had my opinion changed the most was on the aesthetics. Pulling out of the box for the first time, I was actually kind of struck how good it looks. I don't know if I would call it a trash can anymore. It's more of a cat feeder. So yes, this computer looks great and I can see how someone would fall in love with it because it is very striking and look past the limitations, especially if you're using this back in 2013 or even 2016. This would have been a very fast computer and it would have been great for what most people were doing at that time. I think I have a better closing for this video. This computer is actually amazing. That is only in so far as the arbitrary limitations Apple put on the design. And I think Apple does this to combat the innovator's paradox, and it's deeply emblematic of Apple as a company. A more cynical read would be, Apple does this for profit maximization, taking away the ability to exchange parts, but delivering a more interesting product. And damn if it doesn't look nice. Can't innovate anymore, my ass. <laughs>